Directions to Russell Industrial Center in Detroit. Starting route to Russell Industrial Center. I'm on my way to Detroit, Michigan to work with Austin Brantley. Austin's a sculptor who works primarily in clay, and I hear we're gonna be working with a model, so it should be pretty exciting. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a craftsman or as an artist? Uh, for me, it's it's weird because I feel like there's, I feel like you have to be both to be a good sculptor. Because I feel like anybody's an artist if you get up in the morning and you have a like audacity to, to claim that you are one and to know that you want to create something. And then at the other end, being a sculptor and then overall being a ceramicist, like understanding clay, you have to be really good with crafts. You have to really understand. It's, so, it's such a technical thing that I feel like the word craftsman is like synonymous with being like a scientist in some ways because there's so much that goes into it and you've got it down to a science. And being a craftsman, I think is, I think it's not as um, applaud as it should be anymore because it's so, it's so rare to find people that master a skill these days. How well put. I think that's the interesting thing about choosing to be a craftsman or to mm -hmm. follow that idealism in life, right? Is the, the intent of trying to do better today than you did yesterday is how I always looked at it. Some days I know I'm gonna make something ugly because I can just feel it, I, or I know that I'm not gonna make something perfect. I think I strive for, for a, more of like a perfect idea, because I feel like for me, art is about ideas. It's not really about creating something perfect. Um, it's about creating, just creating something. Um, I don't need to have something, I don't need to make a sculpture that looks exactly like a model. I need it, if anything, I want to capture the expression that the model gives, I think, that's one of the things when someone comes to my studios that if I'm working with models, it's not for me to just use them as like a model, it's for me to be inspired so I can create something. I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty intimidated right now. <laughs> yeah. I've never yeah, done you, this before. This I'm very be worried. This is gonna be fun for me too, cause I get to live through you and I remember the first time I sculpted a sculpture and it was uh, very intimidating actually. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So but, we're getting started. We've got a, uh, like some paper here. On yeah, a, this on is a, steel a post. this is just newspaper okay. um, on a flange and a gas pipe. And what that does is it creates a structure, an internal structure for the sculpture. And I'll just be building clay around that. So how do we start? Uh, we pick up the clay and we just kind of go at it. Just one piece? Yeah, sure. Okay. Just to start. Just first start off covering the whole armature with clay. And we're just gonna, you can actually just kind of pinch it together if you really want to sweat. We it can out. see where this is going already. Yeah. We're gonna have some fun. And we're just making, right now we're just trying to get an egg shape of the- Egg the, shape, okay. Yeah. This clay is a low-fire stoneware with grog. So What's grog? Grog is refined uh, ceramics, like uh, so it's fired, fired clay, but then it's grinded up into little, little bitty um, parts, and then put and infused in the clay to make it have a stronger clay body. So you're you're going at it right now. I mean, yeah. you're, you're looking at. Yeah, I kind of, yeah, right now I'm just like getting, I'm, I'm not even really looking that much at her because I know that 
what I know from, from just seeing her right here is that I know that her neck and her head are the same width. And I'm also trying to make sure that it's like pretty straight, like very smooth, like this is all kind of together. And then if you need to, if something sticks out too far, you just use the paddle. Okay. And you put it back into shape. I feel I should apologize to you in advance, <laughs> quite frankly, because I, I don't think I'm going to really do a good job. From, from this plane or view, mm -hmm. I, I see the, the net, her neck. Yeah. And then her head comes out around like that. Is that yeah. what you're looking at? That's what I'm looking at right now. So I'm trying to get that curve from where her her hair and her head is. Okay. All of sculpture, there's always, in figurative sculpture, you're always looking for those S curves. So right now, I think this is the this is the front, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I like to use tools that kind of scrape everything for me. Oh, okay. This is a great tool to use because it kind of helps you develop the planes. Like unify? Yeah, it helps unify and also it helps kind of, it helps me see uh, what I'm trying to do. Like where I'm gonna put the plane. I don't really get too intimidated working with new people and trying different things that I've not done before because I, I'm always willing to fail in it because that's how I learn. For some reason, working with Austin, I felt incredibly intimidated right from the get-go. I mean, leading up to it, I was sort of concerned about it and just, uh, you know, a little overwhelmed. And I, and I really think it had to do with the fact that I knew we were going to be working with a model and it is so such a difficult thing to do, right? To to get the the eyes and the the, the face and the expression and the, the neck and everything, to get all of that proportionally correct and, and actually have it look somewhat appropriate is really difficult. But it was also fun at the same time. Like, it wasn't a right, wrong type scenario. It was what worked for you. If, I'm, if I were gonna make a line from her, from the tip of her nose to her, to the, the neck, I'm looking at the angle that is, and it's just like a straight down angle. Ah, I see. on the center line now that we've blocked out most of the form and that's and what I'm doing is I'm just going down where the center of her face is and I'm creating a line so that way I know where to put all of the features all the smaller planes and then I'm going across her face to the middle of her ear where her ears are gonna be and that's gonna help me know where to put the eyes and the ears as well.
What do you think? Well, I think that what we've done so far is get the basic shapes in order. So okay. that's something that we've, we've got down. And now we're going to just kind of clean that up. Uh, like I see in my sculpture, I want to kind of clean up the neck a little bit. I want to really make it look like hers so I can get that, that angle from the neck. And then we're going to focus on the small forms within her face. So if we look at her her nose to the bottom of her chin, it's kind of like a like a triangle, but it also has like a like a, another form at the bottom. Like if we look at it and break it up into forms, it kind of looks like a few different ones. And then we're going to focus on that and just cleaning up the overall sculpture, making sure that all the transitions work with these big forms, and then we'll go into the smaller forms and then get those details in. What surprised me the most about working with Austin was his speed. He was incredibly fast. I mean, lightning fast. It was, it was, it was something else just watching him because he, you know, it was like he, he saw it in his, in his eye, you know, in his mind's eye, and he just went after it. And he worked really, really fast. Mm -hmm. I can see that you really got those cheekbones in there, which is good. I don't know how to do the eyes. Just think of them as, as balls. We look at Gina's eyes. They're very big, like they're one of the biggest features on on her face. And we also, when she was looking down, that kind of helps helps us see the whole the whole kind of we get get a reference. I'm just looking at her hair line and seeing how much distance it is from her the top of her scalp to where the top of the hair is. If I look, it looks like it's like maybe two to three inches. So I wanna make it at least an inch and a half of thickness if it's gonna be a three quarter life size scale model. I got you, I got you. This was really a lot of fun. I mean, I'm surprised. I wasn't expecting it to look anything like this. So amazing. You're a great teacher. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a great student. And I think that we really got a lot of details in today. Uh, for your first day, I mean, we did incredible. So now we're gonna focus on finishing the sculpture uh, and that entails hollowing it all out. So we'll actually be cutting the head off tomorrow, which is, uh, a weird contradiction because we create it and then we destroy it. In what a, a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> we'll actually be cutting the head off, hollowing out the whole piece, and then we'll be actually um, slipping and scoring it back together. So we'll be using tools to actually reconnect all the parts that we take apart. And then we'll leave it to dry for about two weeks and then we'll actually fire it in my kiln to uh, a bisque fire, which is taking um, this clay, which is greenware, unfired clay, and then we'll be 
turning it to a bisque fire by heating it to about 1200 to 1400 degrees. After that, we'll actually be uh, putting a patina on it. And this is what I use because it's a matte finish and it's not too shiny and it has this very earth-like look. It feels just like you can really, you can really see the details in it. I can yeah. see every single detail that I put into my piece. It's actually a self-portrait and it's a fragment of a bust that I destroyed on purpose. Oh. Uh, and just to get this kind of broke look. Right, right, and, right. Um, as I did that, you can kind of really see the textures and you can see all the life in the sculpture by not glazing it. So I like to use uh, stains to really get that effect. That's gonna look awesome. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to finish this. <laughs> yeah. Me too. So what's the purpose of hollowing it out? Why is that important? The purpose is to make sure that each part of the clay dries cohesively. And to do that, we have to have a quarter inch thickness all and around and inside the piece. And that guarantees a safe firing. If there's any moisture inside the clay, it could actually blow up the whole piece. So every, every time I put something in the kiln, I usually say a little prayer uh, and hope for the best. So I don't get too attached to most of my work, but over 10 years of experience has taught me to just do my best with each piece and don't expect too much, but enjoy the process of just creating it. Call Austin Brantley. Hello? Hey Austin, it's Eric Gorgeous from A Craftsman's Legacy. Hey Eric, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm good man, I'm excited to see the sculptures. How are they looking? Oh, they're in the kiln, they're ready to be open. Ah, cool. Hey, can I head over, maybe we can finish them? Let's do it. Fantastic, I'll see you soon buddy. See you soon. All right, man. Bye. Austin, these are looking fantastic. And it's been about three weeks since we last were together. So what's happened in that time? Since then, um, the clay has actually dried uh, to a bone hard surface. And that's when it's pretty much not even cold to the touch. It's so dry. Um, that means all the moisture is pretty much out of the piece. And then it's fired in our kiln to about 1200 degrees, which is a cone 04 firing. And that makes these bisque ware. They were beforehand, they were green ware. Now okay. they're bisque fired, which means that they're vitrified to the highest temperature they can be fired at because it's a low fire clay. Um, now that we've done that, we're actually gonna apply a patina we're gonna be using wood stains, which is something I really like because it's a matte finish. So instead of doing something glossy where the detail could get lost, we're gonna be able to see everything that we put into these pieces. Very cool, very cool. All right, so how do we begin? Uh, we're gonna just take some paint brushes and we're gonna just open it up and we're just gonna go into it.
What do you tell people you do? What I do is, it's such an ancient thing, you know, so when I tell someone I'm a sculptor, they kind of don't always understand what I'm talking about. It's rare that they know exactly what a sculptor is or what that in, entails. And I usually just tell someone I'm an, I'm an artist. Tell me your definition of a sculptor. My definition is uh, someone that takes uh, the three-dimensional and applies uh, classical art to it. And I think uh, when someone works with clay, when someone works with the figure, that makes them a sculptor in my eyes. I think it's when, whenever you make something, I feel like it's a very powerful thing that you're doing because you get to do that. You get to immortalize something. You get to, it's almost like a, I like to think of it as like a, almost like a time machine is that you get to connect with people through time, through your art. Yeah, it definitely is a time machine. So did you study art? Um, I've studied art for 10 years, mainly on my own. I've taught myself since um, I was 17 years old and I've used my, my um, resources of talking to other artists, like using resources online, talking to artists from all over the world through Facebook, through Instagram. And what I really did was I um, reached out to them and I got advice. And that was the, I think the best thing I chose to do in my early years was to reach out to people with knowledge and ask them for it. And luckily I was able to get something back and I even met people that would uh, introduce me to workshops that I would eventually do in Rome, in Florence, uh, and I also traveled to Mexico to meet artists. And in, in those workshops, I actually learned uh, more than I would have, I think, if I went to an actual art school. When did you realize you wanted to be an artist or a sculptor? I realized that in 2011 in a New Orleans gallery. I was introduced to Frederick Hart's work, uh, Paige Bradley's work, and Richard McDonald's work, and at the same time. And when I saw those sculptures, I, I kind of knew in my mind that this is what I want to do because I was so moved by the work that they did. Just knowing that someone else had created something and, and done something with their life and refined and mastered a craft. That was something that was really inspiring to me because I've always been around uh, great craftsmen in my life. My dad is like the number one for me. He's like one of my biggest inspirations and he's always been a uh, great craftsman. He's always inspired me to uh, master things because he's always teaching himself. So did you work with your hands at a young age then? Yeah, I was helping, helping dad. my dad on construction jobs, helping him, um, I was helping him refurbish bathrooms, build kitchens. Uh, we built a playground structure in the backyard together. We would do little projects all the time. So I was always working with my hands. I think it was just a very creative household and there was not really a lot of barriers for that. Being able to just express myself. Like I, I was never not allowed to draw anything like I, I could just draw and my mom wouldn't be okay if I drew naked women but my dad would be like oh that's fire <laughs> <She's hot. laughs> beauty in the eye of beholder right right so as you grew up you realized you wanted to be a sculptor and an artist and then what did you do about it where did you where did that take you in life it took me a lot of places a lot of ups and downs uh, I remember being um, in a position where I was gonna go to art school and I was uh, happy just to be accepted to receive a scholarship. But then I came to the realization that it wasn't gonna be enough money to actually attend. And that happened at a couple schools. Um, so I sought other ways of learning. I studied in um, sculptor studios. I took private lessons. Uh, I worked tirelessly at, at uh, at a community college just using their kilns and like a field study. And then I did art fairs, of course, uh, small shows, exhibits, uh, to get uh, kind of my brand and my name out there. And after doing that, after building like a clientele, I was able to um, afford to like do workshops in other countries. And that's what really helped me was to, I got to learn from my favorite artists. I was able to learn from them in their workshops 
and study under them and spend time with them, ask them questions about being a sculptor that I would never know going to a school and learning the little things, learning how to financially um, take care of myself as a sculptor, how to provide for my family. Things like that really helped me. Do you have a favorite piece that you've done? I don't think, I always say I haven't made it yet, but I think I recently did something really, really smart. Um, I did a sculpture of a boy holding a flower and I was inspired by my girlfriend's nephew who was uh, sitting on uh, our laundry basket and he was um, holding this, this toy in his hand and she had Snapchatted that for some reason. She like made a Snapchat story of that happening. And I remember just looking on it uh, at my phone and I immediately saw a sculpture from that. And I immediately thought of it as being like a boy holding a flower. And for me, growing up as um, a young black man, I kind of, um, to, to really like give it a real observation, it was pretty toxic. Like it was a very toxic environment, um, kind of like just like with the the media, kind of just like the the stereotypes that I got from school, and also in in my own community as well. So I wanted to make a sculpture that kind of like subverted that, and and I sculpted a boy holding a flower because I think it's, it kind of breaks down those walls because I remember as a kid, I loved to play with flowers. And I remember other boys wanting to play with flowers, but it not being cool or, or people, you know, judging us, whatever. And uh, I kind of want to subvert that and create something different. And it's actually gonna be a public monument that's gonna be across the street from uh, the Barack Obama Leadership Academy uh, on the east side of Detroit. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm so excited. It's going to be in bronze. And I think it's one of the most important pieces I've ever done. That's outstanding. Thank you. It sounds beautiful. I, I felt like a craftsman when I was making it because I did it the complete right way. Um, I worked with a model and I, you know, I, I put every, I put, it was like 10 years of being a sculptor was put into it and I could see it in the work. And that all came from that one Snapchat. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The maquette is actually right there. The maquette for it was right there. And I had made that two years prior, I think working on that one and then being able to see it life size was like so powerful. Can you tell me what's next for you? What's on the horizon? What's the challenge that you want to conquer? I think it would be doing a large scale piece, doing something that's, you know, 13 feet tall, something that you have to engineer and um, fabricate, um, something that's gonna stay there forever, but be so incredibly difficult to create uh, be in terms of scale and in terms of weight, in terms of like uh, installing the piece. Like, I, I love the idea of like just like stopping traffic because a crane is lifting a sculpture and installing it. I love that idea because I feel like creating something that big is such a level of mastery in your craft. And being a sculptor, I feel like that's like the goal is to master your craft and to have something that valuable in a city. At the end of that first day, we had our sculptures done. I remember looking at that and, and, and thinking like, I really can't believe that I had anything at all to do with this. I really, it looked way better than I thought it was going to. And I mean, that's what this whole show was built on, right? Was that sense of encouragement, that sense of surprise that you can do this stuff, right? No experience never really done this before and with some teaching and some hand holding and boom you know look at the things you can accomplish that was you know that one of the basic foundation principles of this television show that's the greatest thing about working with other people is is learning <laughs>